creationists still see evolution as incompatible with their faith. And both creationism and evolution are no strangers to the court. Their legal battles stretch back to the famous Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925. Now, as I told you yesterday, Darwin's theory tells us that man evolved from a lower order of animals. In that case, a high school science teacher in Tennessee named John Scopes was accused of violating state law by teaching evolution. I hereby place you under arrest. Loosely portrayed in the classic film Inherit the Wind, the trial turned into a courtroom show. Clarence Darrow. The defense wishes to place Dr. Keller on the stand so that he can explain to the gentlemen of the jury uh, the exact meaning of the theory of evolution. And three-time presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan. If you had a son, Mr. Sillers, or a daughter, what would you think if that sweet child came home from school and told you that a godless teacher... <laughs> Scopes was found guilty of teaching evolution and slapped with a mere hundred dollar fine. But the verdict would have a chilling effect on science education throughout the country for the next three decades. After the Scopes trial, textbook publishers decided that evolution was just too controversial a subject and so they just quietly removed it from the uh, textbooks. And for most of that time, the textbook was the curriculum. And so if it wasn't in the textbook, it didn't get taught. The chilling effect of the Scopes trial did not thaw until the 1960s. But as publishers slipped evolution back into their textbooks, creationists fought to teach their views in science class as well. Over the next 30 years, the two sides battled it out in court. The fight culminated in 1987, when the Supreme Court decided that teaching creationism in public school science classes violated the separation of church and state, mandated by the Constitution in the Establishment Clause, which prevents the government from promoting or prohibiting any form of religion. To this day, teaching creationism in public school science classes anywhere in the United States remains a violation of students' constitutional rights. Another Dover school board member, Bill Buckingham, a retired policeman, was appointed by Alan Bonsell to head the curriculum committee. It was his job to review all requests for new textbooks. The ninth grade biology teachers had asked for a widely used book co-authored by biologists Ken Miller and Joe Levine. But Buckingham did not like what he saw. In looking at the biology book the teachers wanted, I noticed that it was laced with Darwinism. I think I listed somewhere between 12 and 15 instances where it talked about Darwin's theory of evolution. It wasn't on every page of the book, but like every couple of chapters, there was Darwin in your face again. And it was to the exclusion of any other theory. And at a school board meeting in the summer of 2004, Buckingham made it clear he wasn't comfortable approving that book. The school board put the purchase on hold. So what was it about Charles Darwin's theory that Buckingham objected to? Darwin published his theory of evolution in 1859 in a book called On the Origin of Species, and it has been sparking controversy ever since. It was the culmination of work Darwin started more than two decades earlier, after sailing around the world on a ship called the Beagle. On that expedition, Darwin collected thousands of plants and animals that were unlike any he had ever seen before. And when he returned home to England, he became particularly fascinated by the many different birds he had found on a remote chain of islands off the coast of South America called the Galapagos. There was a bird that looked to him like a warbler, and another one that looked to him like a woodpecker, and another one that looked like a finch, and so forth. And he wasn't sure what these birds were, but they were all clearly adapted for very different ways of life. Some ate insects. Some, for example, picked up small seeds. 
some could crush the large seeds of certain plants which were found on the Galapagos. So they had different appearances, different beaks, different styles of life. When Darwin asked for help identifying these birds, he was in for a surprise. He was floored, he was stunned to discover that the expert ornithologists in Great Britain told him, they're all finches. That's not a woodpecker, it's a finch. That's not a warbler, it's a finch. But why, in this small chain of islands, had he found finches with such different characteristics? Darwin reasoned that in nature, individual organisms compete for limited resources, like food. If, for example, a bird is born with a slightly larger beak than the other members of the population, that might give it an advantage on an island where large seeds are more common. Over many generations, birds with large beaks would be more likely to survive and reproduce, handing down this advantageous beak shape to greater numbers of offspring than those with smaller beaks. Darwin called this process natural selection because the forces of nature, such as the environment of an individual island in the Galapagos, select those organisms best suited to that environment. And he believed that over time, this could give rise to new species. What Darwin pointed out was a general principle, which is easily observed in nature. Species are not fixed that with natural selection pushing or pulling or splitting, species can change over time. Darwin thought all the different kinds of plants and animals we see around us today, including humans, could have arisen by this process. He called the gradual evolution of new species from old descent with modification. And he pictured the relatedness of all living things as a great tree of life, with each twig a different species, ultimately springing from a common ancestor. As you follow the family tree farther and farther back, say from our twig, which we're just one twig in this vast tree, what you see is our similarities with apes, then going further down, our similarities with other mammals, further down, our similarities with reptiles, further down our similarities with amphibians, fish, all the way down to worms and jellyfish and so forth. What you see is a continuity of life on the planet. That is, we're not exceptional in any great degree. We're just a twig on a giant evolutionary tree that includes everything. The common ancestry of all forms of life was one of Darwin's great insights. But he recognized disturbing implications in the idea that humans had evolved from ape-like ancestors. In the eyes of a lot of people, once Charles Darwin had proposed that natural processes could have produced every species on this planet, including us, they felt that took God out of the picture. And about a century and a half later, many people in Dover, like the United States as a whole, agree. One more spider. Come spider. Yeah. To this day, somewhere between a third and half the U.S. population does not accept evolution. I find it personally offensive because I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God and that the book of Genesis tells it like it is as to how we came into being. Uh, God didn't create monkey and then take man from a monkey. He created man. In Dover, Hostility to the theory of evolution had already erupted in vandalism. After a Dover High School student painted a 16-foot mural depicting the evolution of humans from ape-like ancestors. The mural was on display in a science classroom when someone removed it from the school and burned it. Now, as Bill Buckingham continued fighting the purchase of the biology book at school board meetings, the science teachers began to suspect that he had been involved. This idea of man and monkey came into the conversation, and I immediately remember saying to him, does this have anything to do with that mural that disappeared? And that's when he made the remark that he gleefully watched it burn. Right. Sort of under his breath, but we heard what he said. <laughs> Though Buckingham denied any involvement,